And the question that motivates this work is what is the gravitational explanation for the discreteness of the energy spectrum of quantum black holes? Here's an example of the spectrum of our favorite toy quantum black hole, the SYK model. Why is it discrete? What explains its structure? Now this kind of discreteness determines the long time behavior of correlation functions and of the spectral form factor and as such is an aspect of the black hole information problem in the form discussed by Maldacena. Now I should say at the outset that we certainly don't have a comprehensive answer to this question, but we have found some hints and that's what I'm gonna to try to describe today. Let me tell you the line we've been taking on this problem. As I, I think you can see, this uh, spectrum is pretty complicated, okay? There's a lot of uh, funny stuff about it. But it has a simplicity in its average statistics, and we want to uh, aim at that. And so in order to be able to do averaging, let's imagine that we have not just one quantum system, but an ensemble of quantum systems. The main example here is the SYK model, where the random couplings provide the ensemble. Then you can try to compute statistics. One statistic we look at is the following, the pair energy correlation function, given an energy E, what's the probability that there's another one at E prime? This is like the density, density two point function. Here's a graph of it computed in SYK. When E minus E prime is zero, that's here. The probability is zero. That's because eigenvalues repel. Then you go out a little bit and you find a local maximum at the typical nearest neighbor spacing. Then there's a dip and then a second maximum at kind of the average second nearest neighbor spacing. Persistent ripples that fade away because of fluctuations in this kind of uh, crystal. This eigenvalue spacing is very small. If you have uh, e to the s states, the spacing is e to the minus s, which would be like e to the minus n in SYK, a very small spacing. Now, we would assert that this kind of curve with this vanishing and these ripples at near neighbor spacings is a smoking gun for discreteness in an averaged quantity. And as such, it's an interesting target to try to explain. Now, this curve didn't just come out of nowhere, as uh, Brian alluded to. This is actually the density-density correlation for a random matrix ensemble, in this case, the uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble, the simplest one that doesn't assume any symmetries in the system. Cases with symmetries in the general case will be discussed by Edward Witten later today. This is the form, the functional form. It's called the sine kernel formula. And a crucial point, a point I really want to emphasize, is that this is widely thought to be a universal property of quantum chaotic systems, this actual shape. Okay. So, we have a smoking gun, and it's a universal smoking gun. This seems like an appealing target to try to explain. Now, the first thing to do, and what we'll try to do here, is explain it uh, from the gravitational side in the SYK model. And our hope, based on universality, is that the explanation might have some universal behavior, as, uh, the, the explanation might have some aspects of universality as well, as well as the phenomenon. Now, a basic puzzle that we're going to have to deal with is the origin of these ripples. In this formula, they come from this cosine term, cosine e to the s. It's a very fast oscillation because e to the s is big. Cosine is the real part of e to the i e to the s. That's like e to the i e to the n syk. That's doubly exponential in the small parameter in the system. Where does that behavior come from? Well, to start with, we'll focus on an observable that's just the partition function of the SYK Hamiltonian, which is just the integral of the average density with a Boltzmann factor. This averaging is over the ensemble of quantum systems. Now, at low energies, large inverse temperature, this is gauge gravity dual to jakeef teitelboim gravity on the disk to all orders in the Newton's constant, which in this model is 1 over n. Now, we're going to actually try to understand eigenvalue statistics, not in SYK, but in this JT gravity limit. I should emphasize that this is not a uniform limit. Some of the things we'll compute uh, are significantly affected by some of the stuff you leave out in this uh, going to the JT limit. We think that, for instance, things like the sine kernel formula, the things you leave out, are not an important effect. 
But be, to be conservative, let's regard this as a further, a model of the model. Well, here's Jakeef Teitelboim gravity. This is its action. It's built of a metric in a dilaton field. Let's focus on this term. The dilaton here just acts as a Lagrange multiplier that sits the Gaussian curvature precisely equal to minus two. So there's not much dynamics in the geometry. You'll always have constant negative curvature. There's some dynamics of the boundary given by this boundary extrinsic curvature. And then this is a topological term. This is the Euler character. It's weighted by the ground state entropy, which is of order one over G Newton. That's of order N in this model. Surfaces with Euler character chi are weighted by E to the S naught chi. So if for a surface with G handles and one boundary, that's E to the S naught one minus two G. It's a genus counting parameter. At leading order in large n, or large e to the f's naught, the partition function is described by geometries with a fluctuating boundary on the disk. This is not a geodesic, it's got a fixed renormalized length beta. And it turns out that these fluctuations can be computed in a one loop exact way, one loop exact in G Newton. So you get the partition function, you inverse Laplace transform, and you find the density of states in JT gravity. It's got this interesting cinch squared of E form, which will play an important role in uh, what I discuss later. This is the disk, its Euler character is one, it's weighted by E to the S naught or E to the N. That's what you expect a density of states to look like in this kind of model. Now we're gonna wanna go beyond uh, the disk topology. The simplest example of a more complicated topology is if you study two copies of the partition function that's two traces, that's two boundaries. The leading contribution comes from two disconnected disks. That's Euler character two of order e to the two s naught. There's a subleading contribution that looks topologically like this cylinder. It's a Euclidean space-time wormhole. It has Euler character zero, so it's of weight e to the zero, which is one. In fact, this gives the one over energy difference squared term in the sine kernel formula. And when you Fourier transform that, this actually gives what's called the ramp in the spectral form factor that Brian defined. So in this talk, we want to talk about more complicated topologies. Well, for instance, suppose we study the partition function, which has one boundary, one trace, and imagine geometries with an arbitrary number of handles. The Euler character is given by that. So this partition function would be a series over the number of handles, coefficients times the genus counting parameter. Looks like e to the minus s naught raised to the 2g. Well, I don't have to tell this audience this looks kind of like a string perturbation series. But the perspective we're taking is different, and this is a very important point. The genus counting parameter here is not related to g Newton. It's e to the minus one over g Newton. It's e to the minus s naught. These are non-perturbative effects in gravity corresponding to baby JT universes joining and splitting by non-perturbative effects. And because we're in such low dimensions, they have a very simple geometrical character. You call this kind of joining and splitting in gravity a third quantized description. Let me emphasize here that although it's easy to write down these, these topologies in JT gravity, there are only hints for them in the full SYK model. So this is a case where again, we should be thinking of the model as a model of the model rather than a precise limit. Let's look at these geometries a little more carefully. Each one of them has this asymptotically ADS region with a fluctuating boundary of the kind we talked about on the disk. And then it's joined onto some complicated set of handles. Now these handles can move, even though you have constant negative curvature, they're moduli that you have to deal with. You can imagine dividing the surface along a geodesic boundary. These ripples are not geodesics, divided along a geodesic boundary of length b. These things are not saddle points of the JT action. Okay? But because the R equals minus 2 constraint sucks so much of the dynamics out of the system, we'll actually be able to do the full path integral. So let's do it. Let's do it in two pieces. Let's first look at this piece, which we call the trumpet for obvious reasons, okay? You just have to sum over these ripples. 
It turns out that these ripples can be computed in a one loop exact uh, way in one over n, and you get a formula that's explicitly given by this. This part of the geometry um, is constant negative curvature metrics with moduli that change with a geodesic boundary. The natural measure when you have constant negative curvature metrics is the Ve peterson measure. And in fact, the, the functional integral here computes the Ve peterson volume of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with G handles in a single geodesic boundary of length B. Now importantly for us, these Ve peterson volumes can be computed efficiently. The first technology to do this was developed by Witten and then Konsevich using topological techniques and their matrix uh, machine that goes with them. More recently, Mirzakhani gave a geometrical approach. She wrote down a recursion where you build up higher genus surfaces from lower genus ones by sewing geodesic boundaries together and integrating over the intermediate boundary lengths. This recursion, and this is really an important point for us, can be mapped onto matrix model loop equations for resolvents in a very elegant streamlined form developed relatively recently called topological recursion. Now, our genus counting parameter in these surfaces was e to the minus s naught, okay, a very small number, e to the minus m. The genus counting parameter in matrix models is the rank of the matrix. So we need very large rank matrices, matrices of rank e to the m. This is not your garden variety n by n matrix that many people in this room work on. It's an exponentially bigger matrix. This again is a consequence of this third quantized perspective. Now, one of the elegant things about this topological recursion is you don't need to know the matrix potential. All you need to know is the initial, it turns out it's double scale, eigenvalue density, the analog of the Wigner semicircle. For these single cut models, that's all you need. Now, what density do you use to get these Ve peterson volumes? It turns out you use the jakeef teitelboim density, the cinch square root of E formula. So this is a crucial link between this JT approach and uh, the Ve peterson volume. So now we can put this all together. It turns out that these Ve peterson volumes are actually some integral transform of the genus G resolvent. We'll write that as curly I. So the JT partition function at temp inverse temperature beta is this integral over the geodesic length of this trumpet term times these Ve peterson volumes. That's this explicit factor times this integral transform of the resolvent. The trumpet factor plays nicely with the kernel of this integral transform. That gives an integral around the cut of the genus G resolvent times this exponential factor. The discontinuity across the cut of a resolvent is just the density of states. So you have an integral of the density of states, the genus G correction to it, times a Boltzmann factor. But that's just the genus G partition function of the matrix model. So you have that the genus G partition function of JT gravity is just equal to the genus G partition function of the matrix model with that particular tree level density of states to all orders in the genus expansion. Now, if you go beyond all orders in the genus expansion and you imagine for a minute that JT gravity is given by a matrix model, any matrix model with any potential has the same uh, local uh, eigenvalue statistics given by that sine kernel formula. So in some sense, we're done. But now we're in a, in a position to understand the bulk analog of, of, these, uh, of these effects. Now, in order to understand these bulk, the bulk interpretation of this, we have to repeat an old story, but with this new third quantized twist. So here's the old story. We have this series of ge genera uh, weighted by this genus counting factor. Here it's a series of non-perturbative baby universe joinings and splittings. These Ve peterson volumes go like 2G factorial, so the series diverges. It's asymptotic, but it diverges. Now, we're familiar with such divergence series in string perturbation theory. This 2G factorial indicates the existence of non-perturbative effects in perturbative string theory of strength e to the minus something over G string. 
Polchinski taught us that these are due to D braids, which are described by an arbitrary number of disconnected whirl sheets ending on the braid. So if we think of this as some kind of JT string, there should be D brains in the JT string. Here we would have an arbitrary number of disconnected space times. Remember, we're in third quantization. We have e to the minus something over G string. Here, that's e to the minus something e to the F's naught. That's e to the minus something e to the N, doubly exponential. This is how we think this doubly exponential effect is created. You have an asymptotic series of non-perturbative effects. That needs to be completed by something doubly non-perturbative. Well, it turns out that this matrix integral does give a non-unique, non-perturbative definition of the JT string. The potential turns out to be unbounded below, so you need to use a contour choice. That won't affect the things we're interested in, except by very tiny, exponentially small amounts. Now, we know that non-perturbative effects in matrix models are due to the dynamics of discrete eigenvalues, not smooth density, and that there's a dual description by brains. In the early 2000s, a detailed understanding was developed of the brains present in the so-called minimal strings described by C less than one minimal model coupled to Liouville and their matrix duals. And there was related parallel work on brains and topological strings and their matrix duals by these authors. It turns out to probe this discreteness of the spectrum, we want to insert a probe FZZT brain, which more prosaically means we want to take the expectation value of the determinant of a matrix, a, a spectral determinant, times this normalization factor that I won't really say much about. And we can take this technology over directly. Instead of thinking about fancy probe brains, we can just think about the determinant as a probe. It's a very sensitive probe of discreteness. Here's a Gaussian matrix model. That's a typical configuration of eigenvalues. This determinant vanishes whenever E equals one of those eigenvalues. So it has to wildly oscillate. This is a harmonic oscillator wave function for those of you that haven't taught recently, okay? Um, this structure actually survives averaging. There's also a hint of the eigenvalues in the density. It has, makes these little ripples. But this is a subleading effect in E to the minus S naught. Here it's leading. So this is a good thing to calculate. And we calculate it using this topological minimal string technology. At leading order, this brain insertion is determined by exponentiating disks, just as in D brains. The determinant you write as e to the trace log. You expand that out in a power series of traces. Every trace is a boundary. You take its expectation value at leading order. The expectation value of the kth power of a trace is the expectation value itself raised to the kth power. So this insertion is, you can exponentiate uh, this quantity. We write this thing as the exponential of this average with a normalization factor. We write that as e to the disk. And there's a picture of these many traces. This is a first correction to this factorization. There are many disconnected space times. That's like many disconnected world sheets in a string calculation. Now, again, this is just repeating that. To talk a little bit more about what this trace log is, trace log is the integral of the resolvent. There should be a trace over here. So we can write this disk as the integral of the tree level resolvent with this normalization factor. We're integrating along the cut of the resolvent. The important piece is given by i pi times the density. That's what happens at the edge of a resolvent. So this exponential of disk is the exponential of i pi times the integral of the density. The tree level density is of order e to the s naught. So this is like e to the i, e to the s naught. That's like e to the i over g string. So that something I was talking about is really i. This is doubly exponential, and it's rapidly oscillating. It's just what you needed, and it gives the right answer. Now we can go from determinants to resolvents and densities using the basic identity, which is a very standard technique in quantum chaos, you write the resolvent as the derivative of a determinant divided by another determinant. You can think of this as a brain-anti-brain -brain dipole. You have two things that oscillate wildly. Their ratio 
most of the oscillations canceling out, leaving this little debris that also oscillates. This determines a non-perturbative contribution to the density from D-brains. If you want to compute a density-density correlation function, you need two resolvents. That means you need four determinants, two upstairs, two downstairs. And in fact, you can give a D-brain calculation of the density-density correlation function and recover the sine kernel result. This calculation is explained, along with a lot of other things having to do with these ideas, in a poster that Phil Saad has in the poster session, for those of you that are interested. Yeah. This analysis raises lots of questions. In fact, the final section of our paper is essentially a list of all these questions. And I would love to agonize over all those questions with you, but I don't have enough time. So I'm just gonna have to pick one. And here's one. What happens if you don't average? After all, our favorite gauge gravity dual systems, like Super Yang Mills, are not averaged. What happens if you, for instance, take uh, SYK and take one set of Randling couplings, not uh, an average over them? Well, it turns out that things like the spectral form factor, the Fourier transform of the density-density correlation function, go from being smooth to very erratic. The blue thing is an average quantity, the Fourier transform of the sine kernel formula, the red thing is one set of random couplings. The noise is of order the size of the signal. What is the bulk explanation for this erratic behavior like you'd find in Super Yang Mills? Well, the short answer is we don't know. But let me talk about an analogy that we found uh, useful in, in pondering this. Imagine this kind of semi-classical chaos that Brian mentioned, let's say a billiard moving around on a billiard table of the kind he drew a picture of, and then quantizing it. You use the path integral to represent trace e to the minus iht. This is a sum over periodic orbits, e to the i times the action, the classical action. The spectral form factor is two traces. It's a double sum. I've written this double sum in a cartoon, a, uh, a provocative cartoon. These color-coded indices, this is the periodic orbits uh, on one side, this is the periodic orbits on the other. At long times, you have really long orbits, you have large actions, large phases, you have large fluctuations. If you computed this in this billiard system, you'd find an erratic red curve of the kind I just showed. But now let's average. Average over the size of the stadium, over t or interval in time, doesn't really matter. And let's say you do it for reasonably long, but not too long times in the ramp region. The only terms that survive are when A equals B. So these actions and phases cancel out. Now you're allowed to make a time translation on one side relative to the other. That doesn't change the phase. This is Barry's diagonal approximation that gives the ramp. And in fact, you can see that it's analogous to the cylinder. You make a connection here by linking these two jagged ends making a nice smooth cylinder. It's a space-time wormhole connection produced by averaging, not a spatial wormhole produced by entanglement, although it clearly is in that same circle of ideas. These ideas of uh, averaging over randomness and getting connections are reminiscent of another old story, Coleman's ideas about the relation between Euclidean wormholes and fluctuating couplings. So briefly, you consider many baby universes, each with a Lagrangian with some fluctuating couplings around a reference value. You expand and perform wick contractions. This is an old story. This is a figure taken from a paper of Klebanoff and Suskind 31 years ago. Okay. You can then fatten up these wick contractions by doing some kind of handle OPE and turn this into a picture like that. I couldn't find the same matching figure, but you get the idea. You can take a full sum over these disconnected universes and you get a, double, a doubly exponential quantity known in those old days, much like what we had before, except here we exponentiate spheres. For us, we were exponentiating disks. So perhaps we have a choice about the bulk description of spectral statistics. We can have an unaveraged description with simple topology, but with exceedingly detailed and complicated information about microstates like the individual orbits 
in the microscopic phase space, and they're intricate, rapidly fluctuating phases. The word fuzzballs comes to mind. Or you can average. Then you get these nice smooth connections, you have more familiar geometrical objects, but the price for the simplicity seems to be third quantization, wormholes, and he brains. Well, we'll have to see uh, if this makes any sense, and we'll try to keep you posted. Thank you. Questions? There and there. Uh, maybe you had just answered this in your in your last. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, so if you're if you're third quantizing the Jekyll Teitelboim theory, then you you don't have an ordinary you don't have ordinary quantum mechanics, right? You, yes, you do. You have like the the one over n fluctuations of the boundary. That gives a one over n series. Oh, maybe I misunderstood. You, you have quantum mechanics on the third quantized Hilbert space. You, you don't have quantum mechanics in each universe because the universes connect and share information and become entangled, right? So, well, okay. So, so what, I don't even know what, what, what does it mean to talk about the levels of a black hole with exponential Yeah. Good, that, that was my, my point uh, uh, towards the beginning of the talk. Which if, suppose you just say, I want to study a uh, quantum system and I want to study its discrete eigenvalues. That's sometimes hard to do, so let's consider an ensemble of them and look for statistics. Rather than studying this very complicated list of numbers, let me just try to compute some statistics. And the claim is the description of that ensemble of quantum systems is given by something like JT gravity. The, the, the things about discreteness, singles, signals of discreteness are still present when you average. So there is a signal that you are dealing with a finite entropy discrete system <coughs> even after you take the ensemble. And that's what we're trying to explain. Yeah, and a couple of questions. First, Elias. Uh, Uh, thank you for this nice talk. How much of this do you expect to survive in higher dimensional gravity? Yeah. <laughs> it won't surprise you that that was one of the questions in the list in our paper. Uh, Douglas might say a few words. Uh, Douglas, are you going to say a few words about this? I can't even see where going. Uh, well, uh, I'll, say, I'll say a couple of words, and then uh, people will have forgotten by the end of the week. Uh, the basic things you need in order to make this D-brain consumption are very simple. You need essentially the cylinder diagram and you need the disks. The disks are just Euclidean black holes. Those are present in higher dimensions. The cylinder turns out to be a piece, a periodically identified piece of the eternal ADS Schwarzschild geometry. So those ingredients are present. Whether there are other things that screw up the story in higher dimensions is, a, is an open question. But, but some of the ingredients are there. Ben. So, so in, in, in Juan's paper back in w whenever it was, um, <laughs> there was this argument about how there's a subleading saddle where you have the two disconnected, uh, like just when you compute the two-point function, uh, there, there's a subleading saddle where you have like two thermal ADSs. Uh, where you find that this plateau, so you find that the, cor the correlation function kind of goes down, but then there's this other saddle point where it just stays mm -hmm. flat and doesn't mm -hmm. go to zero. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, is, is this kind of an example of the same kind of thing where somehow, I mean, you, again, you can't get the wiggles with this other saddle point, but you can just kind of see the qualitative estimate of the, the size of the, you know, the height of the plateau by, by using another saddle point. I don't think you get the size of the plateau right. Well, you, you get it e to the minus s. I'm not sure if the coefficient. Uh, the is coefficient right. isn't right. Oh, the no. coefficient is yeah. not right. I see. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. For for the gravity gap, for the graviton gas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's see. order one. That would be like the bottom of the ramp. The start of the ramp is order one. 
Oh, I see. So but then it runs back up. It goes, starts at E to the 2S, goes down to 1, and then goes up to E to the S uh -huh. on the plateau. Yeah. Steve? Yeah. Uh, you had these fluctuations in the single realization. Yes. Um, those are singly exponential, I would presume, because they're, they're, there's no sign of doubly exponential in those fluctuations? Well, it depends where you look. Um, on the ramp, when you look at the fluctuations on the ramp? Uh, uh, maybe I'll finish the rest of the question. Uh, would you expect doubly exponential be features in a single realization? Or do you need to do Yeah, that like, the, like, you know, the doubly exponential features is basically this, uh, this sharp transition from the straight line to flat. You can see in a single realization, there's an envelope that kind of does that. That's caused by these uh, doubly exponential things. Um, but the thing is, the, the, the noise is so erratic, I don't even know what, to, how to, you know, you know, what kind of function to fit it to. Right. Uh, Thanks. Question. Steve, uh, to go back to uh, Coleman's work many years ago, as you referred to, uh, there was always the issue of trying to make sense of the Euclidean path integral in gravity, and depending on what you did with the conformal factor, you could either get a double exponential with some sign or the other. Uh, you've chosen some definition here uh, of Euclidean JT. Does it sh shed any light or by comparison with SYK on, on what to do in general? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, I think the two choices were plus one and minus one in those days. Yeah. We like I. <laughs> I seems to be the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, there's a question whether it's plus i or minus i. You have to use different inf you have to use additional information. For instance, from the matrix model, that would be about integration contours to tell you you need equal amounts of both. So you really want a cosine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And now coffee.